Okay, good morning. Um, so let's continue on with chapter three, our final chapter of the course. And today we're gonna to start by talking about section 3.4, which is called the mole and molar mass. So um, the issue, one of the issues we deal with in chemistry is the small size of atoms and molecules and how little mass they have, tiny masses. So it's useful then to introduce terms that allow us to more easily deal with the numbers. Okay, and so the first uh, method that we use is called the mole. And the mole is based on the following idea that the measure of the mass of an atom is typically in atomic mass units, which is an AMU. And an AMU is a very small mass. It's 1.661 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. So it's a really small mass, you know, just to kind of put it in perspective, a gram is a around the, the mass of a pencil eraser, an eraser on a, on a pencil, that's about a gram. So, so an AMU is very small mass. Now it's also useful to have it in kilograms. And remember kilograms, a thousand grams. So you're just gonna move the decimal three places. And so an AMU in kilograms is 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And so there's your um, mass conversion from AMU to grams. Now, if you do the following, if you say, look, I have one gram of something and you ask yourself, how many AMU is that? You get this interesting number. So let me show you. If I take one gram, let's use the abbreviation for gram, which is a G. And then I'm going to put in one AMU per 1.661 times 10 to the minus 24 grams, right? So I'm just doing a conversion here. I'm just converting from uh, grams to AMU if I have one gram of a substance, okay? Let's see what we get. So the grams cancel grams over grams is one, and you get AMU, so that's cool. So how many AMUs is it gonna be? Well, it's one divided by 1.661 times 10 to the minus 24. And you get this number 6.02 times 10 to the 23 AMU. So that's essentially how many, so this is the amount, the number of AMU in one gram, okay? And that ends up being kind of a useful number. We're gonna call that number Avogadro's number. So I'll give it a name here. Or the Avogadro number sometimes it's called. I'm gonna use the symbol N, capital N, lowercase capital A. So if Avogadro's number, and it's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And this is the number of AMU in one gram of a substance. And that ends up being pretty useful for us. And we'll see why that's the case in this section 3.4. So um, in this section, there are several types of problems you're gonna do. And so one is essentially using this Avogadro number. So using the Avogadro number. So I'm gonna take a look at some of these problems from Alex, just so you can kind of see how, how to approach these problems. You may or may not have seen problems like this before. So let's take a look here. The first one, um, using it, what they do is they give you the mass of an iron atom. So they say an iron atom has a mass 
of 9.27 times 10 to the minus 23 grams. And a cooking pot has a mass of 0 0.500 kilograms. Okay, so notice that's in kilograms. I'll talk a little bit about the units in a moment. So then they ask you a couple questions. They ask you for the mass of one mole of iron atoms. So they want you to figure that out. And then they ask you how many moles of iron atoms are in the, the pot. Okay, so there's your second question. Okay, so there's this term, the mole, which I haven't introduced it yet. Um, it's a very simple idea, okay? So first of all, we're gonna make an assumption, which is that this pot, this cooking pot is made out of iron. It's not made out of copper. It's not made out of aluminum. It's made out of iron. So, you know, this pot, imagine it as being made of a large number of iron atoms, right? Steel is essentially iron, um, if you're interested. Steel is essentially iron. It's like 90% to 95% iron. Um, the problem with using pure iron is that it's, it's somewhat soft, it's not real hard. So what you do is you, you melt the iron, it's called ore, you melt this ore into a molten, into a liquid. And then you sprinkle in some charcoal and the charcoal has carbon atoms. That's essentially what charcoal is, is carbon atoms. And what happens is you allow it to cool. You make this mixture, this molten mixture and you allow it to cool. And what happens is the carbon atoms, they, they position themselves in between the iron atoms and that makes it harder. So now you have this substance called steel. So like the Brooklyn Bridge was the first large scale bridge made out of steel, right? Um, it makes it harder, it makes it a harder metal than, than pure iron. Um, and then you can also add other types of metals to it, like, man, like chromium, for example, chromium and manganese. And what they will do is they will give it some resistance to oxidation so that it won't rust as easily. So stainless steel is predominantly iron with some carbon, a couple percentages or a percent iron. And then several percentages, maybe four or five or six or seven percent chromium and sometimes manganese. And then those will give them give them the metal a rust resistance so it doesn't rust that easily. It's called it's called stainless steel. Okay. So it's prim primarily iron. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to erase this up here just so that we have room. I don't want to rewrite the numbers. And let's take a look how we approach this problem. So we're gonna use the Avogadro number, but we have these mass measurements here. So again, remember mass, mass is just like how much substance you have. Okay, so here's our question down here at the bottom. Okay, so we have the mass of one atom. And so the first question is, what is the mass of one mole of the iron atoms? So one mole, so let's define the mole. There's different ways to define the mole, but I'm going to do it in the simplest manner. We don't need the more complicated. So we're going to define a mole, M-O-L-E, as 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Okay, we'll broaden that definition a little bit in a moment, but for right now, we'll just use this one. So the mole, that's just a shorthand for Avogadro's number, this Avogadro number, right? And so they, okay? So if I have one mole of iron atoms, that means I have 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd iron atoms, right? Um, 
the number is enormous, right? And it's probably not that far off from the number of stars in the universe. There's roughly roughly 100 billion stars in the Milky Way, 100 billion. So that's 10 to the 11th. And then there's about 100 billion galaxies in the universe. And there's probably more because every few years they do a more better study and they find there's more and more. So there's probably even more than that. But 100 billion times 100 billion is 10 to the 11th times 10 to the 11th. So that's 10 to the 22nd, right? So you're getting pretty close to 10 to the 23rd. So I wouldn't be surprised if the number of stars is actually equal to about a mole in the universe. That's a very big number, right? So what that means is like, you know, if I, uh, you yeah, know, we'll, we'll look at this a little bit later, but if you've got an iron pot, you know, it's it's got more than a mole of iron atoms. So more than the number of stars in the universe are just the number of atoms in one iron skillet, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. Big numbers, right? So that's why we use this idea of the mole. Instead of saying, oh, six times 10 to 23, we just call it a mole. Just like we do a dozen, right? So instead of saying, how many eggs do you have? You say, oh, I have 12 eggs. You would just say, I have a dozen eggs, right? If you had 24 eggs, you wouldn't say, oh, I have 24 eggs. You would say, I have two dozen eggs and or one and a half dozen, right? 18, you can buy eggs in 18. So that's one and a half dozen. So um, typically that's, that's, that's why we use the mole. It's just a little bit easier to say that than six, to the 23rd, six times 10 to the 23rd, okay? So here's what we're gonna do. We have a mole, okay? So how much is one atom? So I'm gonna write it this way. When we're talking about iron, Someone has measured the mass of one iron atom. That's possible using something called mass spectrometry. And we're going to say this is the number of grams. And I'm going to set it equal to a equation. So I'm going to say this is or an equality. This is equal to the to one atom of iron. Okay. That's how much mass one iron of atom, one iron atom has is 9.27 times 10 to the negative 23 grams. And then I'm gonna say, well, how much would two atoms weigh? Well, it would be twice as much. Three atoms would weigh three times as much. So now the question is, what's the mass of one mole of that? So one mole is just this number right here. You just gotta use that number. And it's not one, it's not two atoms, it's not 10 atoms, it's this number here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this equality here and write it this way. It's 9.27 times 10 to the negative 23 grams per one iron atom. Okay, I wrote, I wrote the symbol before the word, but that's fine. You could write one atom of iron either. Now, the reason I put the grams in the numerator is because I know I want grams. It's asking us for the mass. You know, the question is, what's the mass? So I want to have the number of grams. And then I'm just going to say, OK, how many do we have? 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And if you want to write it this way, iron atoms, right? That's how many iron atoms you have. Just to kind of think about it and think about it in terms of dimensional analysis, the iron atoms are going to cancel. And that's going to give you the number of grams of this large number of iron atoms. And it should come out to somewhere between 55 and 56 grams. Let's see what, let's see what we get. Um, 9.27 times 10 to the minus 23 times 6.02 times 10 to the, the 10 to the minus 23 times 10 to the plus 23 are going to cancel. So you get 55.8. I guess that's about right grams of iron. Okay, now notice that number 55.8. That is um, about the mass of a swallow of water. So if you took a glass of water and took one swallow, a good size swallow, um, that's essentially um, the mass about 55 grams or so. Okay, and so this mole we call it a mole, has a mass of about 55 to 56 grams. And um, that's for iron. 
And each element would have a different mass, right? Because the mass of an iron atom, 9.27 times 10 to the negative 23 grams, is going to be different than the mass of a carbon atom or a hydrogen atom. Carbon is lighter than iron. Hydrogen is even lighter than carbon. So that number, 9.27, would be different, OK? Um, but this is common. And, and the thing that we like about this is that it's in grams. And so that means we can do it in a laboratory. We can measure this in a laboratory. I can say, hey, here's my little balance, which, you know, when you get to general chemistry, you know, 55.8. It's kind of cool. What essentially what you could do is if you if you took a piece of iron and just started shaving it into little pieces like iron filings and then put it in a little cup, you could just start sprinkling that iron onto the balance, onto the scale. And when you got to 55.8, that would tell you you've got one mole, right? Because we just did the calculation. One mole, this is one mole right here. That mole has a mass of 55.8 grams. So when I get to 55.8 on this scale, I would just quit adding the iron filings and that would tell me right there, hey, I've got one mole, 55.8, perfect. Or 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay, so it's kind of cool. Now I want to make a, a oh we have to do the second part. So let me let's do the second part first uh, before I discuss this more. Um, how many moles of iron atoms are in the pot now? Okay, so there's another piece of information here is that they've got this cooking pot. I don't know, it should have been a cooking pan, I would say, uh, skillet. A cooking pot has a mass of 0.5 kilograms, okay? So let me write that number down over here. Zero, oops, 0 0.500 kilograms. And this is your cooking pot. Okay, I'm gonna convert that to grams because our iron is in grams here, or we could cook, we could convert the iron from grams to kilograms, but we want to have them be in the same units. You don't want to make comparisons of grams to kilograms. You want to have them both be the same. Okay. So I'm going to do that 0. 0.500 kilograms. A kilogram is a thousand grams. So that's 500 grams. I'll put a little dot there, a little decimal point. Okay. So 500 grams is our mass of a pot. Okay, so now the question is how many moles of iron atoms are in the pot? Okay, so let's think about it this way. One mole weighs, I'm gonna round it, 50 grams. Okay, let's just say it's not 55.8, but it's 50 grams. Let's say one weighs 50, right? If I said, hey, this weighs 50 grams, this is one mole. And then I said, okay, now let's have a second mole. That would weigh 50 grams also, right? So that'd be 100 grams, right? Well, how much do we want to go up to? We want to go up to the pot. The pot's 500 grams. So how many of these moles would you need? Well, if each one weighs 50, five of them would give you 250 grams. Looks like it's 10, right? Like if you had 10 moles, so each one of these is a mole, right? 50 grams. All five, all 10 of them. That's going to give you 500 grams. Okay, and so um, the answer there, it looks like it's around, it looks like it's around 10 moles. So let's take a look though, let's be more precise because it's not 50 grams, it's 55.8. So let me make a little more room down here. Okay, so the pot is 500 grams. 500 grams, and one mole is 55.8 grams, right? That's of iron. We're assuming they're both iron, okay? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say it's one mole per 55.8 grams. Now, the reason I put one mole on the top in the numerator is that the question is how many moles? So I'm trying to find the number of moles. So I want to have this in the numerator so that my answer is in moles. And then we're going to multiply this by the mass of the pot, which is 500 grams. So grams will cancel. Grams over grams is one. And you've got one times 
500, which is 500, divided by 55.8. And you, it looks like it's it's not 10, right? I, I said it's, let's estimate it as 10, but it's about 8.96, it's almost nine, right? And so that's how many moles of iron. So in other words, this pot, which is made out of iron, here's what we did. We said, hey, this thing weighs 0.5 kilograms. And then we did a conversion to show that it's, well, 0.5 kilograms is just 500 grams, right? And then we did this other conversion where we said, hey, you know, one mole of iron is 55.8 grams. So then we just said, well, how many of these moles, right? So each of these is a mole. How many of those are gonna go into the 500 grams, which is what we just did right there. And we ended up with it's about nine. It looks like it's about nine moles, approximately nine moles of iron will fill up that pot, okay? That's how much iron goes into making the pot, almost nine moles, okay? Uh, Professor, how did you get that number? 8.96? Yes. By, by saying that one mole is 55.8, and then the amount that we have is 500. So how many 55.8s go into 500? So it's 500 divided by 55.8. Mm-hmm. Exactly. 500 divided. It's just technically it's one times 500, but one times 500 is 500. Okay. Okay. So it'd be kind of like this. Suppose I said the following. Suppose I said, you know, I've got five kilograms of shoes and then one pair of shoes is 0.4 kilograms. How many pairs do we have? How many pairs of shoes? What you do is you'd say, okay, it's one pair of shoes per 0.4 kilograms. And then you'd say, well, we've got five kilograms. And then that would give you five, was that one, was that 12? You get 12 pairs. Is that, well, it's actually uh, 12 and a half pairs. <laughs> five divided by four is 1.25, I think, right? So it's actually 12.5. 12.5 pairs, so it doesn't come out. So it comes out to half a, half a pair, right? So there's one shoe in there. Some of them didn't get matched. But it's essentially the same idea. What you're doing is you're saying, hey, this is how much one weighs, and this is how much the total is. So how do you figure out how many of these are going to go into the total? So what you do is you take your total, and you divide that by how much one is. Right, and that's going to give you the number that go into the total, and that's essentially what you're doing. So you're saying it's 500 grams. One weighs 55.8 grams. How many are in that 500? And that would just be 500 divided by 55.8. It's a pretty common thing that we do with moles. Okay. Now I did want to mention something about Avogadro's number. I'm gonna actually I'm gonna pull it up here on on the web because. Because um, Alex is going to harass you on this unless you do it just right. So what do I have here? Okay, you have to be careful. Here we go. So Avogadro's number is not 6.02. It's actually 57 times 10 to the 23rd, okay? So that's Avogadro's number right there. So one mole is equal to that, which is the same as Avogadro's number, okay? So when you do these calculations, be careful, don't just use 6.0 times 10 to the 23rd or 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Um, you can click on the Alex. Um, when you did that original, at the beginning of the course, you did that little tutorial that had you go through um, using the calculator and the data tables and all of that on Alex, there's a value of Avogadro's number that you can use off that table. So if you use their calculator and their table, you'll get the same number of sig figs they want. But uh, be careful because if you just use 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, 
times 10 to the 23rd, you'll get approximately what Alex wants, but it might be far enough off that it says, hey, you got to recalculate this thing. So, so use the value they give. That's a lot of sig figs. It's kind of, it's an important number to scientists because it's essentially how we quantify the amount of matter. And that sometimes is important, it often is important. Um, so so we, have to use, we have to use that long number on Alex. So the one on Alex may not go out that far. It probably goes out to, you know, 6.022141. It probably goes out that far, 141. Um, but if you just click it, if you just click the one that's on your data table on Alex, it'll probably put the whole thing in there. That way you don't have to type the whole thing out every time. Okay. When in doubt, you can use this value though. So it's a lot of sig figs. It's like, what is it? 10, two, four, six, eight, 10 sig figs. The more sig figs something happens that has, that you can infer from that, that it's important to people how many sig figs it has. Okay. <coughs> Let's take a look at a new one. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, another one. Close that. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a slightly different one. Um, so here it says you have a raindrop. And the raindrop has the mass of 50 milligrams. Okay, that's how much mass of the raindrop you have. And then you got this ocean and its mass is 7.08 times 10 to the 20 kilograms. So first question, find the mass of one mole of raindrops. And then the second question is, how many moles of raindrops are in the ocean? Okay, so um, what's interesting about this particular question is that it gets to an important point, which is that when we use moles, it could be for anything. It could be for atoms of iron. It could be for molecules of water. It could be for photons of light or it could be for raindrops or even stars. And so it doesn't matter what we're measuring, it's just a number. One mole is six times 10 to the 23rd. So you could talk about a dozen shoes or you could talk about a dozen eggs. The same is true for the mole, okay? So the tricky part of this is they're gonna give you all these prefixes here. We want the prefixes to be the same, okay? So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put both of these masses into grams. It, for chemistry, the gram is a good unit to have things in. So let's take our milli. And so this is the mass of one raindrop and let's convert it to grams. So one milligram. So this is when go back to those, to those metric prefixes. They're gonna be important. A milligram is one times 10 to the minus three. Millis 10 to the minus three. So now let's convert it. So times one times 10 to the minus three grams over one milligram. So I'm using this equality as our conversion factor. Milligrams are gone and you get 5.0 times 10 to the minus two grams. So that's the mass of raindrop, okay? So I'm gonna write that down. It's 5.0 times 10 to the minus two grams per one drop. I'll just call it drop just for short, okay? Now we want, we don't want one drop. We want one mole. The question is what's the mass of one mole of raindrops? Well, multiply by this Avogadro's number. <laughs> I'll put a few more sig figs in here. So 6.0221 times 10 to the 23rd drops per mole. That's what a mole is, is that big number. So if you multiply that by that by that big number, okay, what happens? Um, you're gonna end up with the drops canceling and you're gonna get grams per mole. 
that's going to be your unit strike, right? You have grams up here, and you're going to have moles down here, so grams per mole. And that's exactly what we want. We want to know how many grams are in one mole, so grams per mole. So 5.0 times 10 to the minus 2, make sure you're practicing your calculator here, times 6.0221 times 10 to the 23rd, and you get 3. 0 0.011 times 10 to the 22nd grams per one mole. I'll write it that way, per one mole. That's how much one mole has. Pretty big number, right? Now, that <clears throat> compare that or contrast that to iron. Iron was 55.8. That's a pretty small mass, right? Like I said, that was a swallow of water. Now we're talking about 10 to the 22 grams. That's a huge number. The reason is an atom is much smaller than a raindrop. A raindrop has so many molecules of water, it weighs a lot more than an atom. So one mole, you know, typically we wouldn't use the mole to measure the mass of raindrops because it's such a large number, okay? Even though that's a very large number, let's compare it to our ocean now. Our ocean is in kilograms, right? So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take our kilogram and convert that to grams, right? Because remember, we're in the second part, we're, con we're, we're making a comparison of how, ma how, much, how many raindrops are in this ocean. So a kilogram is a thousand grams. So let's make sure it's the same as we have here, grams. But how, did you, how did you get 3.011? Um, by multiplying 5.0 times 6.0221. Five. Yeah, 3.011. That's what I get. It's five times six. Right, but keep in mind, you got these exponents. You got 23 here. And you got minus two here. So 23 and minus two is 21. Now, if you get 30, you might have gotten 30.11. If you have 30.11 times 10 to the 21, you're going to have to move this over one to put it in scientific notation. Now, when you move it over one, that's going to make this go up one. And that's going to be 22, right? So be careful. Um, you're doing, you're using scientific notation in these calculations as well. That's something we covered back in chapter one. Um, so wait, I'm I'm just a bit confused by that. The um, so so it gives you 30.11. Right, so if you have 30 times 10 to the 21, we're not gonna report it like that. That would be an improper way to report the answer. When we use powers of 10, we wanna put it in scientific notation. So you have to move the decimal point over one. Your calculator will probably do that for you, but it's important for you to understand that you gotta do that too, right? So when you move this over one, you get 3.0 times 10 to the 22, right? This goes up. Every time you move this decimal one position to the left, this exponent is gonna go up by one. Um, I, I mean, I don't even know how to use the calculator to make that kind of calculations. I don't even, but the, but, um, so why, so when you move it, so you move it, so it goes from 21 to 22. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because remember, so, exponents are this, right? If I say 10 times 10, this is what they would teach you like in the third grade, right? That's 100 or not in third grade, maybe the fifth grade, right? Um, but this can also be written as 10 to the 1 times 10 to the 1. You add the exponents, you get 10 to the 2, right? That's exponential or scientific notation. Right? So that's what we're going to use. We're not going to use, we're not going to report big numbers like this, right? We're not going to do that. We're going to write it this way. All right, we're going to use scientific notation. So, so that's important okay. to make sure you get that. 
Okay, but why why would why would thirty point one one times ten to the twenty one why would that be wrong? Um, because it's sort of like this. If I were to say, for example, uh, example of this. Um, when we report data, um, when we report numbers in science, um, there are what we call conventions, which are agreements. And those conventions are based on certain ways in which you report information. So in, when, it, when we're dealing with numbers, one of those conventions is that you can use 30 if you're using a prefix. So for example, I could write something like 30 kilojoules using a prefix, right? That's the prefix. So that's an acceptable method for reporting numbers. If we're not using prefixes, then we use scientific notation, and that's an exponential notation. And the convention for that is that you write a number between 1 and 10. So 3.0 is between 1 and 10. And then you use the, you know, the appropriate exponent would be there. So you either use 30 with a prefix or you use a number between one and 10 with a power of 10, but you don't do both, right? So like you don't, you don't put um, 3.0 times 10 to the four kilojoules and you don't do 30 times 10 to the three joules. You do either one or the other use either the prefix, which allows you the flexibility of having this as 30 or three, whatever the answer comes out to be. But if you're using the scientific notation, you're gonna to have to use between one and 10. So you can't use 30, right? You gotta use between one and 10. That's just the convention of how we report numbers. Steve, okay, you... fine. So why, so when you move the decimal point, why does it go from 21 to 22? Why not 21 to 20? Oops, I'm just going to save that, but I don't mean to save it. I'm just going to do one. Um, oh, because of this. So if you have 3.0, I'm sorry, if you have 30 times 10 to the 21, right? Well, let's think about what 30 is, right? 30 is 3 times 10, right? So really what you have then is 3 times 10 times 10 to the 21, right? Now, what is 10 to the 21? 10 to the 21 is one followed by 21 zeros. So exponential notation is based on the idea that every time you multiply something by 10, so if I multiply this by 10, you just add another zero. So now you have 22 zeros, right? instead of 21, because you multiplied it by 10. So since 30 is three times 10, it would follow that 30 times 10 to the 21 would be the same as three times 10 times 10 to the 21. And since every time you multiply it by 10, you're adding another zero, it would also follow that this would now be 22, right? Um. Um, okay. Right, because 10 is 10 to the 1. 10 times 10 is 100, which is 10 to the 2. 10 times 10 times 10 is 1,000, which is 10 to the 3. So if you're multiplying 30, <clears throat> let's multiply it by 10 to the 3, for example. That's the same as 3 times 10 times 10 to the 3. And every time you multiply it 10, this goes up by one. And that's that's powers of 10. Okay. All right. Um, there's one more question in here. Oops, I think I lost my number. So let me come back over here. Um, 
Oh yeah, it was what was this? 3.011 times 10 to the 22 grams per raindrop or per one mole. Okay. So let me erase this. So so what was that answer? Three times ten to the three times ten is three to the three. To the no, four? Three, to the three, three times 10 to the x. So the form is, is three times 10 to the x. So when you report these numbers, it's going to be a number times 10 to something, right? And that x has to be a whole number. It can't be like 1.5. It's got to be like minus six, got to be an integer, minus six or plus six, something like that. Okay. Okay, so then the other issue is that we've got this ocean, right? So here's the deal. You got this big ocean, it's like a big bath. And the mass is 7.08 times 10 to the 20 kilograms, okay? And then, so let's put it into grams. So a thousand grams is a kilogram is 7.08 times 10 to the 23rd grams, right? If you multiply this by a thousand, this is gonna go up to 23rd. So there's the mass of the ocean. And now what we're saying is, you know, the mass of a mole of raindrops, right? We just did that in the first thing. So just to kind of show a little diagram, this is what we figured out to be the mass of one mole. It was 3.01, I'm just gonna round it, 3.01 times 10 to the 22 grams, right? So notice this number here, 10 to the 22 is smaller than this one, right? So what that tells you is that you can fit more than one mole of water of raindrops into this ocean, right? If this number here is larger than a mole, there's your mole, then that means you can fit more than one mole into it. And so what we did, just like we did the last time, what you do is you say, okay, Here's how much one mole weighs. Here's how much the whole thing weighs. So you take your total and you divide it by how much one mole weighs. So that would be 7.08 times 10 to the 23rd grams. So that's, that's how much your ocean weighs. And then you're gonna divide it by. Now, the way I'm gonna write it is using dimensional analysis. So I'm gonna write it this way, 3.01 times 10 to the 22 grams is equal to one mole of drops, right? That's essentially what we calculated before. So I'm gonna multiply that by one mole of drops per 3.01 times 10 to the 22 grams. But keep in mind what we're doing, right? You're taking this and you're dividing it by that, just like I said, you're taking the total dividing by how much one mole weighs. But this is showing it in terms of dimensional analysis. So 7.08 times 10 to the 23rd divided by 3.01 times 10 to the 22 and you get 23.5 and it's moles of drops. So this is the moles of raindrops, which is an interesting answer. It essentially says the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean is essentially 23 and a half moles of raindrops. But keep in mind, a raindrops, you know, little thing there, it's a very small volume, 50 milligrams is its mass. It's not very much. So that's, that's less than the mass of um, ibuprofen tablet, which is like 200 milligrams. So it's a lot. It's a lot of raindrops, right? 23 and a half moles of raindrops. But it ends up being a nice, you know, a nice number, like a nice kind of round number, 23, 24. It's something you count to, 23 moles of raindrops. Okay. All right, so practice those. Let me um, bring up another type of problem. Sorry, my computer's starting to act up this semester. So I'm gonna have to log back into Alex. Just a minute.
Um, Professor, the um, I don't understand. Do you you before in your previous calculation, you said it was seven point eight times ten to the twenty kilograms, right? Seven point zero eight. Huh? I think it was seven point zero eight. Yeah. Times ten to the twenty kilograms, right? That's right. So, um. So grams would make it 10 to the 23? Yes, exactly, exactly. Because kilos a thousand, kilos 10 to the third. So 10 to the 20 kilograms times 10 to the third grams per kilogram is going to give you 10 to the 23rd grams. Absolutely. Kilograms cancel and got you 10 to the 23rd. Exactly. You got it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about molar mass. So we just did we just did the mole. Now let's talk about molar mass. Unfortunately, there's no good symbol for molar mass, so I'll just write molar mass each time. Now let's talk a little bit about what the molar mass is. What I'm going to do, gosh, they really pick out weird elements, right? Okay, what you do is you can use the periodic table. So let's come back to our periodic table. Okay. And I'm going to pick an element. The first problem we're going to do is calcium. So I'm going to pick calcium. So calcium is element number 20. And then you got this number down here. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this as the molar mass. Okay. Now, previously we said that that was the <clears throat> atomic mass, but here's what happens. If you have one atom, the mass is 40.08 AMU. But here's what happens. If you have one mole of atoms, sorry, let me write this a little bit bigger. It's hard to see it. Now remember, a mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, right? That is going to give you a much larger mass than one atom, right? If you have one atom, it's going to weigh a lot less than a mole of atoms because a mole is a big number of atoms. So here's what you do. You get to use this number again, but it, units are going to be different. So one mole of calcium, remember that's that big number. You get to use the same number, 40.08, but it, there's no way it could be the same units because you know one atom cannot weigh the same as one mole. So you use different units and it's grams. So I'll actually write it out for this one. It's grams, G-R-A-M-S. So this is one of the reasons that the periodic table is very useful. You can use that number down here, 40.08, as the atomic mass, how much one atom weighs. But you can also use it as what we call the molar mass. It's the mass of Avogadro's number, but in the units of grams. So be careful, atomic mass, that's how much one atom weighs, and the units are AMU. Molar mass is Avogadro's, one mole, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And that is in grams, okay? But it allows you to do different calculations. So here's an example of what we would want to do. This is called calculating and using the molar mass of the elements. Okay, so a chemist weighs out 80 0.02 G, remember G is grams of calcium. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to calculate how many moles of calcium is this? 
Okay, how many moles is this? And here's the way to approach these types of problems. They're telling you how much you have. So imagine a little picture. You've weighed out a pile of this stuff. We don't know how big that pile is. It could be small, it could be large. It takes some practice to kind of get an intuition of how much that is. That's how much you have, 80.2 grams. Okay, it's calcium. Now, what you do is you come back over here, you look at this number right here, 40.08. That number right there is how much one mole weighs. That's what it means. So you didn't, you could draw a little picture here, right? So let me do this, let me erase that. I'll draw the pile like this. So there's your pile, 80.2 grams. And now, oops, let's do some blue. Think of it this way, 40.8 is how much one mole weighs. It's actually 40.08. Okay, that's the meaning of that number. 40 points. It's a little table. It's like actually just like a data table that tells you the numbers, right? So one mole is 40.08. Well, think about it, just sort of roughly speaking, right? If you've got 80 grams and one mole weighs 40 grams, 40 is half of 80. So if one mole is 40 grams, a second mole would be another 40 grams, so you'd have two moles. It works out almost perfectly for this problem. It's not exact, but it's pretty close. So it looks like you got two moles in there. So let me show you how to do that mathematically, or at least using our symbols here. Again, dimensional analysis, which we covered in chapter one, that's the approach we use. So what you do is you take your measurement, 80.2 grams of calcium, okay? And that's what you're given. And then you use the molar mass. Now the molar mass is written this way. One mole of calcium is equal to 40.08 grams. And then it's just, you ask yourself, what's the question? Do they, are they asking us for the number of grams or are they asking us for the number of moles? The question is how many moles? So they want the moles. So you put that one on the top. So you multiply it by one mole of calcium. That's what you're looking for, moles and then divided by 40.08 grams. That's a G for grams, okay? And so again, there's your dimensional analysis, grams of calcium, grams of calcium. And we already know the answer should be pretty close to two because we kind of counted it out. 40 grams is one mole, we have 80 grams, so that should be two moles. So let's see how close it is. 80.2 divided by 40.08, and you get, it's pretty close to two actually, it's 2.00 moles of calcium, okay? This ends up being a very useful measure of mass for us, the molar mass, because this is something we can do in a very, we could do this in our kitchen. You can buy scales for your kitchen that can weigh out 100 grams or 200 grams or even 500 grams. So what I can do is I can just put out some calcium, weigh it, and figure out how many moles of that calcium we have. And what we'll find as we go through the rest of the chapter is that number of moles ends up being a very useful number. It allows us to do certain types of calculations, many types of calculations that allow us to do chemical um, problems, solve chemical problems. But the first step do, is this, looking you the molar mass in the periodic table and using that in this conversion. Mm -hmm. Do you do you round this up? Um, well, you know, it, on my calculator, it came out to 2.00099. So if you've got 80.2, which only has three significant figures, that's going to round up to 2.00, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, if, if they had told us it was 80.200 grams and we had five sig figs, then you might round it to 2.001, right? Now you'd have that extra sig fig, 2.001. But since the measurement only has three sig figs and the periodic table has four, we would take the lesser of it, right? Three sig figs. So it looks like it rounds off to right about 2.00. Okay, let's try another one. Um, let's see, show another. Okay. Oh my God, that, it gave me the exact same problem with the same number and everything. 
That's interesting. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to show you how to go back the other way. So in this one, what they do, forget all of the um, detail of who's doing this, right? A chemist versus all that. Um, what they tell you is that you measure zero. 0 0.010 moles of nickel. Okay. And they tell you that's in a reaction. So now the question is calculate the mass of the nickel. Okay. Now, again, when you see moles of a substance, if they tell you the number of moles of water or the number of moles of nickel, immediately you want to think molar mass, because that's the sort of concept we're dealing with. How much does one mole weigh, right? It's almost analogous to a price. How much does a pair of Nike shoes cost? You know, how much does a dozen eggs cost? A molar mass is a, a fixed value, like a price. It's the weight of some amount of substance, okay? Now, nickel, you got to look that up. So you go to your periodic table and you look up nickel. So let's see, nickel is 58.69. So I'm going to go ahead and write it here. Nickel is element number, gosh, which one is it? Um, let me write it here. All right, let me just type in periodic table. Oh, wow. Wait for ourselves a periodic table. Okay, 28. I don't know why I didn't remember that. So element number 28. You don't need the 28, but, it's, but I just want you to see it. So it is 58.69. Actually, I'll go ahead and add an extra sig fig, just so you can sort of see how that works. 58.693. Okay, so remember, that's the number you want to use for these calculations, molar mass. So whenever you see these problems, like here's the number of moles of something, what's the mass? Or the mass of something, how many moles? That's the number you want to look for right there, OK? OK, so here's the way I'm going to write this. I'm going to say 58.6, oops, 0.693 grams of nickel is equal to one mole of nickel. That's how much a mole weighs. Okay. Now, because the density of water is about a gram per milliliter, that's about 59 milliliters of water. So 59 milliliters of water is about, about half of what I have here. This is about 100 milliliters right here. So 58 is about a little under half that, or a little more than half from that. Okay. So now here's how we approach this. Take your measurement, the number they give you, and you write that down, 0 0.010 moles of nickel. And then you multiply that by your conversion factor, which is our molar mass. So you ask yourself, which one do we want to know? Did they ask us for the number of moles or did they ask us for the mass? They asked us for the mass. So that means you want to have the grams on the top so that you can um, get rid of the moles by having the moles at the bottom, right? One mole of nickel. You want the mole to cancel and then you have grams of nickel. So it's 58.693, okay? Now, let's do the, actually the calculation is pretty easy because you're multiplying by 0 0.010. They made the number easy enough that you get 0.58693 grams of nickel. And then you ask yourself, okay, how many significant figures should we have? Now, this is a little tricky with this one because of these zeros. This number has a lot of sig figs. It's got five of them in there. But this one has fewer, right? This one doesn't have five. Now, 
Let's go back to chapter one with the counting of zeros. If you recall, what we said was that if you have a zero in the front, that was called a leading zero, that does not count as a sig fig. So you do not count either of those numbers as significant figures. If you have a zero in between, so like in between a one and a one, right? Then it does count. So that one would count as a sig fig. And then we said, if you had a number at the end, so this is a, what's called a, a trailing zero, it's at the end. So meaning it's after a number between one and nine, then it was a bit ambiguous, but if the number has a decimal point, you do count it. You count the trailing zeros if it has a decimal point. So this zero does count. So any number between one and nine counts, so that does. And any number at the end, any zero at the end, as long as there's a decimal point, then it definitely counts. So that gave us one significant digit and a second one. So it has two. So this one has five, but the other one only has two. So you take the smaller number, you round it to the fewer. So you start over here, there's one, there's two. So you only have two digits. So 0 0.5, but the number that comes after the eight is five or greater. So you got to round up, right? You have to round this one up. So the eight becomes a nine. And so now you got 0.59 grams of nickel, right? So only two sig figs in this one because the 0 0.010 only has two sig figs. And there you go. And then just round it up, okay? So let's see, let me take a look here. Let me get rid of that one there and that one there. Um, do I still have, yes. Okay, let me show you one more um, example of this sort of thing. So this is called calculating and using the molar mass of diatomic elements. Okay. So in this one, we're gonna deal with diatomics. So let me make a list of the diatomics. These are important, you wanna memorize these. Okay, so memorize these, there's seven of them. The diatomic elements are elements that do not exist as individual atoms in nature. They exist as molecules, as diatomic molecules, two atoms. So the first one is hydrogen. The second one is nitrogen. Now I'm gonna kind of try to put them in the position they are in the periodic table so that you can find them on the table to memorize them easily. So the next three are right next to each other. Oh, sorry, let me bring them down, I'm sorry. I'm gonna bring them down a little bit here, just so you can, again, coming back to the periodic table. N2, O2, F2. Okay, so those, those three over there. And then the next three, I said there were seven, are right underneath the fluorine. Okay, so you have one over here on the left, which is hydrogen. And then you have three in the non-metals, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And then all of those elements down to iodine. These are called the halogens. These are in group 7A. This is the chalcogens, which is in group 6A. Um, so actually, it's interesting. The nitrogen, I noticed Alex gave a question where it asks you to find the, the family of nitrogen, and it called the pinkogens, which that's um, kind of a little overkill. Um, there's group 5A. And then, of course, hydrogen is in group 1A. So, right? so those are your seven elements. So what we're claiming is that in nature, they do not. So if I say, you know, oxygen reacts with, don't write O, write O2. O oxygen reacts with would be O2, okay? Same with any of these seven. Those are the seven diatomic elements, okay? So the question here says that you have 78 0.3 grams of nitrogen gas. Okay, calculate 
the number of moles of nitrogen gas. Okay, so calculate the number of moles of nitrogen gas. Okay, so this is where you want to be careful. Because it's nitrogen, that means it's one of the diatomics. Now, here's how you approach this. Again, just like in the previous example, you go to the periodic table, you look up nitrogen. Nitrogen is 14.01. There's your molar mass of N, right? But since it's nitrogen, it's actually N2. And N2 weighs twice as much as N, right? If something weigh, if one shoe weighs 14, a pair of shoes would weigh 28. And that's exactly what happens with nitrogen. So N2 is not 14.01. It's two times 14.01. And so that's 28.02. So the molar mass of N2 is 28.02. So now you can approach it the way we did it. You take your mass that you're given, right? There's your measurement. So there's your 78.3 grams of nitrogen gas, which is N2. And then we have our molar mass, which is now 28.02. So what we did was we said, oh, the question is how many moles? So we want one mole on the top, one mole in two, and then your grams on the bottom. Okay, grams of N2, grams of N2, and now you're left with the number of moles of N2. So 78.3 divided by 28.02, and you get 2.794 moles of N2. Now let's go back to our sig figs. This number only has three. This one has four. So our answer should have the fewer, which is three. So one, no zeros here that we have to worry about. Well, there's one zero that's um, a captive zero. It's in between, but that would count. So one, two, three, three sig figs. And the number that comes after the nine is less than five. So we could just truncate it. And you've got 2.79 moles of N2. Okay. So there's our answer. So had we not considered that this was a diatomic, if we just naively said, oh, we're just going to use N, this number here would have been 14.01. And you would have been taking... 78.3 divided by 14.01 and you've got twice as much you would have had you know 5.68 moles right um, or for 5.78 moles but because it's a diatomic these seven elements you want to make the molar mass twice as much they're twice as heavy and that's kind of cool so when we breathe oxygen in the air we don't breathe o o is actually poisonous if you breathe in o you die we breathe in o2 when we breathe in nitrogen out of the air, we don't breathe in N. Again, N would be poisonous. It would kill us. We breathe in N2. But only some elements are like this. Only seven of the elements are diatomics in nature. The other elements tend to be monatomic with a couple of exceptions. So, so those are the seven you want to remember. Hydrogen all the way at the top on the left, element number one. And then it makes like a little, little turn here, right? So starting in group 5A, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. You might think based on what we talked about in chapter, uh, chapter one, really, that maybe underneath nitrogen, phosphorus might do the same thing, right? See all the halogens do that, but it's not the case. It's just nitrogen, oxygen, and then the halogens, those four elements right there, okay? So very good. So that is our introduction into the mole. That is our introduction into the molar mass, which is section 3.4. So do these section 3.4 problems. And then next week, what we'll do is we'll look at um, combustion analysis and calculations with balanced chemical equations. So we'll see how far we get into that. We may just get into the combustion analysis next week. And then the week after that, we'll get into um, calculations with balanced chemical equations, okay? And so some of your, some of you, if you're talking to your friends in the class, your colleagues, 
Some of the second exams have been regraded by me as I went through it. I think I've done, I think 12 of you. But for those of you that took the exam last night, um, those haven't been done. So those will probably get done by Wednesday. So check back, I would say Thursday or Friday. If you, um, if you had actually done your exam on, you know, late last week or you, all the way through, I think yesterday around four or five o'clock at night, then I've already gone over yours and you can look and see how your grade changed. Okay, your score changed. All right, so have a great week. Let me know if you have any questions um, about chapter three. And um, we're sort of, we're, we're into the deep stuff here. This is really the stuff that you're gonna need in Chem 11, chapter three, the mole, the molar mass, balancing equations, all that kind of stuff. You're gonna need that a lot for next semester. So um, try to put in as much effort as you can here. Okay, so take care. Bye.